Now the recording is on. Okay, good. Um, yeah, well, my name is Louise Petstrup Andersen, Louise Andersen, and um, I am a PhD student at the University of Greenland at the Institute for Learning. And I am here with a colleague today. She will introduce herself later. I will start um, to give a talk about my PhD project. Before I do that, uh, let me start with a short introduction to Greenland and what this is all about. Um, okay, so there lives approximately 56,000 people in Greenland and around 7,500 children goes to the public primary schools. There's only one private primary school here in Greenland, so it's it's basically public, all of it. Um, there are primary schools all around the country. As you might know, um, the country is pretty big and the towns are far away from each other. So there are some schools that are fairly big and then there's some schools which are very small and with only like a few kids. School children spend 10 years in primary schools in Greenland. And um, we know that when school children end primary schools, about one third pursues further education, either upper secondary or they go abroad for a year. Uh, and about one third starts working. And then there's one third who goes into nothing. We don't really know what they do. They don't really do anything. Um, yeah, so that's the situation at the moment. This picture here on my slide um, was taken in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, it's taken here in Greenland. A lot has changed since then, and a lot hasn't. A normal class still unfolds with the students being seated at their desks and the teachers standing in front uh, of the class telling the students what to do. And it is still the teacher who runs the show, so to speak. Um, When we talk about primary schools, everybody has an opinion about them, and they are often debated both at, both at the political level and at the private level. But the thing is, though, up until now here in Greenland, no one has, from a pedagogical perspective, studied what happens inside the classroom. There might be tons of reasons why only a third pursues further education when they have ended primary schooling. But as a person coming from the pedagogical field of research, research from inside the classroom, which takes the school's children's perspectives, are vital if we want to understand anything about what is going on. So the aim of my project, my PhD, is to gain an understanding of what happens inside these classrooms and how these experiences affect school children's desire for learning and education. Um, the question is, could what happens inside the school have an effect on school children's desire for learning and in the, the end on what they do when they're done with school? Well, <laughs> during this talk, I will tell you a bit more about what I do and how I do it. Um, yeah. So, but first, try and imagine this. <clears throat> you live in... Um, in this little small town, you're surrounded by ice and water and rocks. In the summer, it's all water that you're surrounded by. You might go fishing or visiting nearby settlements uh, with your family. You might even be the one steering the boat, sailing the boat. You might be shooting a bird or some animals with your family during the winter. You might go dog sledding or fishing on the ice with your friends. In this little town, which you can only go to, get to either by plane or boat, there's a hospital, there's a grocery store, there's a, there's a gym, and there's other necessities. In the middle of the town, overlooking the water, it's a big building, and it's red. It's your school. Okay, 
then imagine this. It's Thursday morning. <clears throat> it's 8 o'clock. Your teacher comes in to your class, and so does your classmates. Your teacher starts telling some of your classmates that they have to take their shoes off. And he then goes over to one of your other classmates and tells him to put his phone away. He doesn't want to do that. So, so, um, so your teacher and your classmates are discussing that for a few minutes. In the end, your, t your classmate gives in and puts his phone away. Your teacher then goes to the whiteboard in front of the class. And he says, he writes, biology. He then starts to draw a tree. You look out the window where there's no trees. Uh, and in fact, you haven't seen a, seen a tree since the last time you were in Denmark. He then draws a leaf. Uh, and he starts talking about how everything circulates in the air. He also draws a sun. And, and uh, he writes a long formula on the black on the whiteboard, and he calls it the photosynthesis. He says that it is important and that you should all write it down. So you and your classmates go grab your notebooks, and some of you writes it down. When the teacher is done, um, he gives you some printed exercises for you to do, and the class go along, and then after some time, your teacher puts on an animation for all of you to see. It shows the same thing as what he drew on the whiteboard earlier. It shows a tree and the leaf and how it all circulates and uses the word photosynthesis again. The class is a bit noisy now. The teacher stops the animation saying, we might as well stop now because no one is listening anyways. The teacher goes out the room and class ends. So what was that? That was a field observ observation from a ninth grade biology class. And this is what I do in my project. I study schools, children, school life, what they do when they are in school, both during classes and during breaks. I do this through a mixed method design using both quantitative and qualitative methods. First, I've done the quantitative part, uh, which consists of a nationwide survey where a colleague and I have asked school children from 5th to 10th grade across the country how they experience their everyday school life in regards to well-being, didactics, and learning. They've been asked to answer questions such as explain a common class in English. And we've also included specific questions for 9th to 10th graders about their plans when they're done with primary school. This quantitative part was done basically to get a general idea about how school children experience their schools. Up until now, we really don't have any idea about it here in Greenland. Then there's the qualitative part, which consists of ethnographic fieldwork, where I go out into the classroom and do the field observations, informal and formal, interviewing and talking um, with school children and teachers, and I follow a class for a longer period of time. I stay with the class the whole day and try to get an insight into their lives. I don't just talk to the children about their school life, but also about their everyday life and try to get this whole perspective. Yes. So, why do I do it? <sighs> why look into the classroom? I'm not the first, it's not the first time a pedagogical researcher goes into the classroom and looks at how a school day unfolds for school children, but it is in Greenland. I do it for, yeah, for several reasons. First of all, as I said, it's never been done before here. When I first came to Greenland a couple of years ago, um, I started working at the teacher's chair training program here at the University of Greenland, um, where I taught in pedagogics and didactics. Um, and it very fast became clear that we don't have any knowledge about how things unfold inside classrooms. And we don't know how the school, what the school children thinks about it. We use research 
developed in usually Denmark, and we use general theories, um, which is fine and which is good, which we should do, but it's only fine to some extent. Because what I've found this far is that and growing up in Greenland gives you a different set of competencies and a different worldview. You might know how to sail a boat or how to go ice fishing, but you might never have been outside of Greenland. Growing up in a town like I just told you about before, miles and miles away from another town, surrounded by water and ice and rocks, will inevitably have an impact on what you can do and what you've seen and the experiences you have. And we also need to be aware that in these communities, the educational level is fairly low and the children probably doesn't just read books for fun at home, not the ones I've talked to. Um, and their parents doesn't do that either. And these things must be taken into consideration when a teacher teaches children around in the country. Second of all, I do it because there's a need. As I told you about in the beginning, about one third ending lower secondary goes out into nothing. And about 60% of the 18 to 25 years old still haven't completed upper secondary. Several reports show how students' uh, ac academic performance in regards to grades are falling, uh, and the schools are often criticized. But when school is being debated <clears throat> here in the country, it is always things outside the school which is in focus. It's always about how uh, children, how, how it's because that there's not enough apprenticeships for people to get or it's because of the parents, or at the moment, at the political level, they're about to change the whole system, school system, because it's the school system that's, bro that's broken, apparently. But again, the school is seems to be like this black box. No one ever really goes into, inside the school and talks to the children. And that is why I do it. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> then what? Um, well, we know from learning theories and child development theories that children and human beings are wired to learn. We want to learn and we're pretty good at it. Because what is very interesting to see is how children start their life eager to learn and how it's like trial by error a thousand times. For example, when, they're, when they are trying to learn how to ride a bike and when children start schooling, they're also very excited. But during their time in school, something seems to happen. I've done a few observations in second and fourth grade to supplement my observations in ninth grade. And what I can see this far is that the children in second grade are completely different than the children in ninth grade. They are much more engaged in their school. They are eager to tell what they know, and they're raising their hands all the time, and they want to talk to the teacher. This is not what I see in ninth grade. And I told a teacher in ninth grade about what I had observed in second grade, and he responded, well, so I guess they're, they are actually able to do it. And this sums up the struggle pretty well. The teacher doesn't even think that the children want to learn or do anything when they are in school anymore. He's given up. And this is basically what I see when I'm in ninth grade. The students and the teachers have given up. They are All the teachers are pretty frustrated. One teacher told me how he's simply given up because he can't get the students to do anything and he said so now I just give them simple exercises from their book that's the only thing I can get them to do without too much trouble and other teachers tell me how hard it is to get the students to do what they plan for them to do the students too seem to have given up when they are in school during one of my last field trips I observed a test week uh, it's a week where they uh, try how their exams will be like when they are in 10th grade. It was all written tests, uh, where, for example, in Danish, they would have four hours uh, to write a text with a predefined topic and genre. 
the first hour, the students would uh, read through the topics and talk about them in groups, and then they would have three hours, hours to write it. When the three hours started, after 40 minutes, the first student would hand in his paper, and one hour later, the last one would, ha would hand in his piece. Only one student would write more than one page. A teacher afterwards said to me, it's like they come here and that's basically it. They don't even try. And when I talk to the school children about their school, they don't tell me that much. They don't really have an opinion. But when I ask them about what they do when they're not in school, it's a whole different story. They tell me about how they love to play Fortnite, a game, um, and how they love K-pop which is Korean pop music, and how they want to learn Korean, and are doing it through the internet um, so that they can understand the music they're listening to. And when I ask them about what time of the year they like the most, they have all different kinds of answers. And this actually is noted by another study from East Greenland, where a researcher studied how resilience building uh, can take place in schools, and she noted that it was interesting that when the children talked about positive life experiences, they never talked about their schools, despite they all talk about getting an education as a means to get, getting a good life. So, what happens when they are in school? Why can't the teachers get the students to do anything? Well, the good old philosopher John Dewey once said, and I quote, I frequently hear dulling devices and empty exercises defended and extolled because the children take such an interest in them. Yes, that is the worst of it. The mind, shut out from worthy employ and missing the taste of adequate performance, comes down to the level of that which is left to it to know and do, and perforce takes an interest in a cabin and crammed experience. This quote might explain why the children actually seem to be to only be willing to do their simple exercises from their books, as one teacher told me, and as what I've also seen. Because um, this is what they do most of the time. Um, one of the results from the nationwide survey adds to this. Um, it is clear here that the children across grades and across subjects mainly do things that involves books and exercises connected to those books. One student even wrote, simple exercises, no learning. Dewey also argued, as you probably know, that learning must be an active process um, where you, through the process of inquiry and trial by error, um, are learning, and it must take its starting point from the children's own experiences. For learning to occur, teachers must build upon those ex existing experiences, and so children get new experiences about the world. Through doing, thinking, reflecting in a world-like manner, they will learn more and be more curious about the world that they live in. The biology class I told you about earlier, what was that really about? Learning about the photosynthesis by drawing a tree in a country with basically no trees on a whiteboard while sitting at a desk. Does that connect to children's existing experiences and knowledge about the world that they live in? We have to remember these children are able to sail a boat, to shoot an animal, or to search the internet when they want to learn a new language. The other day I went into a classroom, and in this classroom there was this poster hanging, and on the poster it said, how to act during class, and it had three bullets. The first was, sit still and do what you're asked to do. The second one was, if you have any questions, raise your hand, and the third was, if you get done with your exercise before everyone else, go grab your extra book and do those exercises. The question to me is, what exactly is it that children learn when they learn that school is about sitting at a desk, raising their hand, 
when they have a question in learning about life on a whiteboard? And what kind of impact does it have on their desire for learning and education? This is what I will spend the next couple of years looking further into, and this is what my PhD is about. Thank you. Yeah, that was it from me. I think uh, we will go to Ivalu. Okay, I start now. Um, yes, uh, my name is Ivalu, Ivalu Matthiasen. Um, I am a PhD student at the Institute of Learning. And I will tell you uh, a little bit about my PhD projects. Um, I started my PhD project uh, 1st of Oct October last year. Uh, I'm still in in the initial or startup phase. Uh, I, I teach in Greenlandic language at Chichas Education Program. Um, so my PhD project a title is People's Syllable and Morphemic Reading Strategies in Primary School. A study of reading instru instruction in a didactic perspective in Greenlandic language teaching. So I research in reading instruction and strategies in primary school. My focus in primary school is second and third grade classes. Um, <clears throat> so, mm, my research questions is as follows. Uh, the first research question is main question. What didactic design supports people's reading learning? Uh, and to, um, to, to answer the main question, I had made uh, three, three uh, sub-questions. Um, what to what do primary school teachers to promote people's reading development? What reading strategies are conducive to people's reading learning? And how can reading instruction in primary school make experiential, creative, and playful so that people's reading is facilitated and quali qualified? Um, the last question is is based on a on an experts, experts group's recommendation on a general strengthening of the language teaching. Um, yeah, I will go, go back to this to the recommendations. Um, <clears throat> the background of, of the project is the current language teaching illuminated by an expert group's report on strengthening language acquisition. Uh, and the, ne the results of national tests in, grade, in third grade and the evaluation of Greenland's teacher education program. Um, <coughs> the evaluation, re evaluation report contain, contains uh, recommendations as well to, uh, to develop a teacher education program uh, toward a modern research and research-based education. Mm. And the, the research goal is uh, to uncover reading instruction in the beginning stage, examine what reading strategies are used and how they are used in primary school. Um, so based on the recent research of reading, I organize an intervention projects that test different didactic designs focusing on both syllabic and morphemic strategy reading. Uh, various didactic designs are developed within reading instruction with a test or examine, examining, uh, examining designs that facilitate and qualify people's reading. Based on that background, I will set up reading didactic for the Greenlandic Primary School. Mm. <coughs> so uh, the method 
uh, the, the research questions will be addressed through a qualitative study using a design-based research approach. Uh, a design-based research approach is ideal for this study as it takes into account the teacher's experience of practice and ex expertise and combine them with literature reviewed. This will resul result in a detailed and de relevant analysis of both the literature and teacher's views in the development of the formalized research questions. So I have uh, in my method is divided in, in four phases. Uh, right now, now I am in phase one uh, still. Um, as you can see, in the first phase of the research uh, is collecting data. Uh, common topics in the literature will be identified, like reading strategies. Um, the topics to be reviewed include, partic include participant observation, uh, video observation, uh, sound recordings, uh, which is uh, people's uh, allowed readings, and people's written products. Um, my field work la uh, last week was cancelled due to corona coronavirus crisis. So I hope I, I still can make um, uh, do my field work this semester uh, this uh, semester. But yeah, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> so phase two. Um, uh, the development develop of uh, teaching materials, and then I'm going to test uh, test the didactic design uh, of teaching materials, and then analyze the test and redesign. Um, the theoretical framework. Uh, according to various researchers, reading ability depends on two, two uh, components. So reading is equal word reading multiplied with language comprehension. It's the uh, 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 formula, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to um, go into details uh, in, the, in this uh, formula. I just want to... Um, I just want to highlights that uh, my focus my focus is word reading also called word decoding um, which is the identification of single uh, written words either by letter sound associations or by recognition of the unique letter sequence um, so my focus my focus is in word Word reading is, as I mentioned before, uh, syllables and morphemes in, in words. Um, and since the theories used are mainly based on Indo-European languages such as Danish and, and English, which is completely different uh, structure than Greenlandic, then there are other considerations to take in Greenland Greenlandic in relation to the complexity to uh, the people's uh, people has re reached in beginning reading. So <coughs> yes, that's my uh, project about Oyana. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, if if um, if the audience has any questions. Uh, you can ask uh, by typing in the chat box or or by using microphone. Yeah, uh, both of the presentations. So the first question from Tuya is, I believe, to Ivano. Uh, what what in your opinion is the connection between the language learning and culture? I think um, Greenlandic culture is is very uh, important and are uh, somehow uh, connect, connected to language learning. Um, 
So if you if you know the more you know about the culture, the the Greenlandic culture, the the easier will uh, uh, the easier you will learn uh, Greenlandic, for example. Yes. The next question for from Myri was was to Louis. Uh, she wanted to ask Louis if the pupils who um, you're working with um, in year nine have opinions on how to improve their experience in the classroom. Um, yeah, actually uh, they do. Um, in the in the quantitative survey, they express what. Uh, when they do like their classes, um, and that they they like classes more where they actually know why they have to do it and where they are doing things, it's it's not that their opinions aren't that surprising. Uh, you know it from the series. But yeah, they do. They do express uh, that the classes they have now are not are not uh, what they like the most. Like them to be more active. Yes, and then Tuya was asking: Is the reading material based on t Greenlandic culture? I think this was to Ivalo this question. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, many many teachers uh, uh, complains about the lack of uh, Greenlandic materials. So many materials is is not uh, uh, I mean uh, don't have a context to Greenlandic culture because of uh, lack of materials. Um, so uh, we have some uh, not many but. Uh, we have some Greenland uh, materials uh, we, based on a Greenlandic culture, but not many. And most of them are, have a Danish or, or English in, in uh, context. Yes, and then Frank, Frank was asking, uh, I think this is for both, both of you. Uh, he's aware that the indigenous population of Greenland has some connection to Canada's Inuit population. Uh, can you please describe the student populations in your studies? Is it a single demographic? And what diversity is resident in these populations? Well, I can start. I, uh, actually, I don't include uh, the biggest cities in my study. I don't include the capital and, and the next biggest city is Nukem, because uh, life there are, are very different from the lives in the smaller towns. Um, a, a life that's much more like bottom life, in, yeah, where it's very small and, and the nature is much more uh, a big part of your how about Ivalu? Uh, I think Frank wanted to ask this question from Ivalu as well. Um, can you please describe the student populations in your study and is it a single demographic? And what diversity is resident in these? I, 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 I can't I really answer the, the question. Sorry. So Frank wants to specify is there a single identifiable indigenous population in Greenland and in these schools? Uh, in Canada, there are 70 different languages and many nations. So, so uh, yeah. yeah. It's, well, here it's it's. Uh, well, the language. Maybe you should talk about this. Uh, uh, the the most of the our students is a, a native um, indigenous population like Greenland Greenlanders. We have very few uh, from other countries, maybe I don't know, 
very few in Danish, for example. Um, and we don't have um, we don't have uh, foreigners uh, students. But there is like in the, the language uh, I know that the the Greenlandic language differs very much from uh, you know more about the the, uh, the East Greenland the uh, East Greenlandic language is very different from the West. Mm. It, uh, the dialects we have. Three th uh, dialects yeah. in Greenland. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I know for West Greenland and Greenland, we can have trouble. Mm. Yeah. Um, but Besides that, uh, the population is mainly talked about as one single nation. Mm. <laughs> it's a single. Uh, uh, homo what is it? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any more questions from the audience? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, thank you both. It was really interesting to hear hear about your uh, studies and and um, looking forward to read your uh, final results when when you finalize your PhD studies. And um, thank thanks a lot for uh, giving these presentations. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. So uh, I think we can close the